Love. Crimson blood. Poison. Eternity. Revenge. Two. Sacrifice. Mother. Ritual. Scarlet. Prayers. Heresy. Hell. Solitude. Sky. Madness. God of world. Adore us. Hello everyone, Cheshire the Cat here uh, joining Kaim on his journey, as was promised in the previous episode. Now, some of you have been wondering why I haven't been doing this for the last few episodes. The reason is because I wanted to contain as much of the original playthrough as possible before jumping in on commentary and giving a bunch of spoiler territory. However, we are now heading for the last two endings of Dragonguard, and so now the story isn't as much of a spoiler, and I felt it would be more fitting to commentate as we get into a whole second playthrough of this game, because to get those last two endings, I would have had to have played through the entirety of the game one more time, which is going to be hyper-compressed into the second season for you guys. This isn't even like when I played Conclus and uh, basically got all the endings just so you guys wouldn't have to play that game. Totally not spoiling potential future recordings. Um, but also because a lot of you guys want me to play Nier Automata years ago. A lot of you wanted me to play that and... I said I would play Nier Automata after I've played the games in correct order. 
So, here we are, starting from the Yoko Taro original that started it all. I don't know why the game audio recorded that way, I'm gonna have to double check something in OBS later. Um, yeah, so this is Dragon Guard, which was, if I recall correctly, I don't know if this is Yoko Taro's very first game, but I know it's the first one he made that leads into the near universe. Aside from that, it's funny that this just kind of became a hit as a JRPG. My wall note just attacked me. Okay. Just gonna pick that there. <laughs> Editor, you know to cut that out, right? Anyway. The Empire is too strong. This. I was expecting. I don't know, I guess I was expecting a JRPG similar to like Final Fantasy or Secret of Mana or Legend of Dragoon. I had never played a Dynasty Warriors game before, but apparently this comes really close to that. <laughs> I have to say, reading through the notes on what went through Yoko Taro's head as he made this game is really funny. It essentially came down to, if I'm remembering correctly, it came down to, I want to make the worst RPG ever. And I don't mean as in, like, make a bad game. I mean, like, he was saying something about, like, how he was getting tired of heroes whose dark sides were as shallow as a kiddie pool. But like, I am the hero who will save the world, but little do they know my darkest secret. Butter's toast on the opposite side. And I'm like, yeah, I can see where he's coming from on that. So, we're going to give you an RPG of the worst heroes. <laughs> these are all these are all terrible people. So it's like, do we really want these guys to win? No. Oh. For example, Kaim here is an absolutely... Kaim is a homicidal maniac. It's, it's like... He's on a quest for revenge against all the dragons. No, he just kind of wants to kill everybody. He's not a good guy. None of them are. Except... Except maybe... Stere, whom you guys met near the end, and we'll get into his story later. I do like Yoko Taro's means of developing a world, though, and explaining it to the viewer. It, <clears throat> you can go into this game immediately, and it starts off with a bit of dialogue from Verdele talking about this war between the Union and the Empire. It doesn't say which side you're fighting on, until you get to here. And it's like, oh, I see, Kaim is part of the Union, and he's fighting the Empire. Okay, got it. There's no, like... There's dialogue like that, where they're like, your sister, I mean the goddess. It's like, it... Some stories have dialogue like that, and it makes it feel stinted and awkward, but... In this case, it makes sense because that that is Kaim's sister, and the Union respects her as the sister of Kaim before the goddess. It almost like she either became the goddess recently, or no one really wanted her to be the goddess. So mission's over. Protect her. Protect okay. Furiai. It, it's an. I like it when a story respects the intelligence of the reader, or a film respects the intelligence of the viewer, or a game respects the intelligence of the player. You don't need fifty thousand pages of dialogue and exposition saying that the empire's the bad guys and 
the union is the good guys, which even that's not clear. That there is no good guys or bad guys. These are two sides at war. That's it. There's no good or bad here. It's only later that the emp that they're like the empire is trying to end the world, but it's not the empire. It's the watchers, and we'll get a little further into that. And here, a moment like this where Naim is just a dragon. It's killed my parents, right? Yeah, but he's having a flashback. It's a fitting response to the scenario. And it very quickly puts out there, oh, his family was killed by dragons. So he wants to kill the dragon. And you immediately see the conflict of, I want to kill this dragon, I, I wish to live. I wish to live. Despise me if you will. But I shall not die. It's a good scene. Your answer. A pact or and I don't know why the audio skips like that. I was stuck having to use an emulation. Um because the physical copy I had is uh somewhere else right now. I have I have it out on a loan. Um I am already dead. Where this body drops and rots. Is of no matter now. Did I mention this game is the worst heroes? Hi, Leonard. You interrupt us. Go back to hell. I'll dive into his story in, in the next chapter, actually. But another good example of this is it's actually a bad example. I see a lot of slice of life stories and stuff where it's like, oh, do you not know how to play tag? Oh, do you not know how to play poker? Or do you not know how do you, how do you breathe? And it's like, if it's something that's based on real-world understanding, I don't need a show to explain to me how poker is played. Hey, sure, some people just don't know how to play poker. They could also look it up in the real world and then come back to it and be like, wow. Thank you, Story, for respecting my intelligence and knowing I could just look something up. Still alive, you're blessed by the devil's luck. Packed with you. And again, here in Dragon Guard, it's a, a pact. The player, I'm sure at this point, the player is like a pact. What's a pact? What does a pact do? Unless if you read the booklet in the little PS2 box, which some of these games forget wanted you to do that, they almost required you to do that. I don't know why I'm messing with the camera like that, but okay, I guess I am. As you can imagine, I am recording this narration after I've played through this game <laughs> three times to fully engross myself into the story. These cinematics are really good. Or really PS2. Your answer. A pact or death. We are united by our need to live. Well. Yes. A pact. I remember the scene breaking me out the first time <laughs> I saw it, because it's... Yeah, you can just, you know, casually rip out your soul from your body. It's just, it's just a thing. That's why it's such a painful process, it's just like... It's like, oh, I see, you are ripping out your own soul. Cool. But again, that's respecting the player to be like, oh, clearly you are taking something very important out of you. It must be your soul, which in Japanese mythos, the soul is an extremely valuable thing. I'm lacking the words, my god. Then again, your soul is also in your bud, so... Don't believe me? Look it up. Anyway, back to dragons. 
it's a unique experience playing this. Um, do I think it's worth the value that this game is currently out on the market for? Absolutely not. Same thing with Rule of Rose. Is if you want to drop 200, 800, almost four thousand dollars for a physical copy of one of these games, good for you. That's I'm, you. You spend your money however you want. I have a, I have legal access to a physical copy, but I chose to emulate it out of convenience, and it worked out for me. I really it. it it took me forever to get used to the flying mechanics in this game, and once you get a handle on it, it's actually a lot of- I would say these segments were more fun than the ground combat levels, just because of how complex they made. I want to call them dogfighting segments because that's exactly what it is. That and the designs of the enemies are very creative. It's neat to see... Like, this is clearly a fantasy world, and yet Yoko Taro has managed to perfectly blend a not-quite-fantasy and a not-quite-technological-based world. And it's neat to see the merger of the two. I don't see that so often. I see, like, steampunk creations, or mystified machinations, which I guess is as close as we can get with these. But even then, the mystical machinations are stuff like walking castles, or sentry units. These are... these are just flat-out warships. And it's... Interesting to think that there could potentially be, like, somewhere in Lord of the Rings... Let's say Lord of the Rings' universe, for example. They already have cannons, and they already have flying steeds in the forms of dragons, eagles, wyverns, what have you. So what's to stop them from making something like a hot air balloon or a dirigible and then putting a cannon on it? Or, and then extending that further, and then eventually getting into a technological era. It's interesting. It's a neat concept to think about how would magic and technology merge. And the this blending of two things that wouldn't naturally work together is a running theme in all of Yoko Taro's games. There is machination, there is magic, and it makes for a really unique take on fantasy. Like the kind of thing that I would expect to see in Artemis Fowl, which was done later on. I also like the geometry of magic and how it follows a grid or it follows a radii. Like, very clear lines of math and science in the enemy. It, it's interesting because you don't see stuff like that in the Union. You see, in comparison to what the Empire is putting out for combat, the Union almost seems primitive. That's not the right word. It, it, it seems medieval versus modern. Which, again, just makes for really neat theming and contrast. I'm not gonna lie, at some points in these dialogues, I have to just. There were points when I was playing this game and I was just like, Yoko Taro, are you okay? <laughs> He has such a blunt perspective of humanity. 
return at once. And he portrays it through some of those characters, and it it's almost amusing after a point. Now you can dismount. Go. <clears throat> And then just, but at the same time, it makes, we're learning the perspective of this dragon hates humans, this human hates dragons, and now they have to work together. It makes, there is a conflict that the player has to assume between the gaps. And... It just goes back to not overloading the player with a bunch of unnecessary information. The Empire soldiers are I, don't, around the castle. I don't need I don't need a cutscene to tell me how much the dragon hates humans. The dragon just said how much they hate they hate humans in like two pieces of dialogue. And as for the human, we got very brief flashbacks that would have realistically crossed his mind while being faced by Rather faced with a dragon. I would definitely say this game is worth playing. It is a unique experience, albeit clunky and grindy if you're trying to get all the endings. If you're willing to settle for the initial three endings that you can get, good. If you can settle for the fourth ending you can get, also good. The fifth ending. We'll get there when we get there. <laughs> I can actually hear my sub, my own playing style in the back of my head, just like everybody, get out! This is my dragon. I am not afraid to burn my own tower to the ground! <laughs> While I was recording this, uh, I was in conversation with Urza and Final and Rosemary and a bunch of other people. And we, I couldn't help but make them laugh as I'm on the dragon. Like, I need to kill all these people and burn down the enemy! Do, 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 <laughs> Just like singing a really stupid happy ditty from atop the dragon, just Hey, I had that joke while playing Fortnite too. It's just like they just got three player kills. God, he's good. What is what's going on through his head? Boom! Never fear the serious player. Fear the silly player. No, my dragon. <laughs> The other reason why I had chosen to narrate this in the post-edit is because this game is really good to zone out to, and I think that's a trait that comes from a playstyle similar to Dynasty Warriors and the games like that is it's a lot of Go here, slay enemies. Go here, slay enemies. Go here, slay enemies. Go here, find a box. Go here, slay. It, it's not that hard. You are you are given an objective, a place to go, and a thing to do. It's really simple, and I love that the game just kind of gives you an opportunity to just shut your brain off while playing this. And it makes, at least for players like me, this makes for a, a game that's good to zone out to is a game that's good to relax to, which is 
funny because of how dark and disturbing the story of the, of this game is. Lord Kaim, sire, we cannot hold them. So there, it's just a contrast of like, what do you do? What do you do in there? You seem to be pretty relaxed. Oh, I'm just wiping out an entire enemy field while trying to save my sister, who may or may not have a crush on me, and also because I have to save my best friend, who may or may not have a crush on said sister. That leads into a jealous thing, and then creates an absolute secondary battle warfare, and unleashes a god of chaos onto the world. What? <laughs> you know, just another Tuesday. <laughs> just another, just another silly video game for teens and kids. They are in the castle. Hurry! <laughs> now that I've said that all out loud, it's like wow. I've always been to the like, hmm, this game's pretty dark, hmm, this game's pretty messed up, but now I can actually look back and like, oh god, this game is actually really disturbing. So, your voice is lost. The trifling price to pay for the pact. No matter, I shall speak for the both of us. It was still fun. Into the castle alone? Very well, I will await you here. I will know soon enough when you die. My life is now your life. You cannot live on hatred alone. I like that. It th There was your little bit of exposition that explains how a pact works. It comes at a price. What is going on? and how um you, you get the little bit of exposition but then at the very end angelus who hates humanity is the one who tells kaim you cannot live on hatred alone oh yeah the weapon system in this game is absolutely magnificent um for those who are curious what i'm trying to do here you get a story out of each weapon if you level it up to four and you also get like its maximum spell casting ability uh damage ability but each weapon gets experience something i kind of like about this each weapon gets experience not from what kind of enemies you take down but how many enemies you take down so you could so so basically one enemy is one point of exp even if it's a massive enemy with a giant big ol' hammer, one enemy, one EXP. So, you could, once you have all the weapons, go back to just the first couple of levels and just go on a spree. And you, you could pick one of the levels that has almost unlimited spawning enemies. I would suggest one of these beginner ones, rather than the massive battlefield in Chapter 5, just because um, of the way these enemies are contained, and also anti-magic enemies make this make, make the grind a little more painful. So these earlier levels are better for it, just because you still get plenty of them. Who knows, maybe once I'm done with episode E, I'll even throw in a bonus episode where I share the story of each weapon. Actually, that's not a bad idea. The editor will remember this. I mean, they're sharing souls, it would make sense that they could read each other's minds. What I find interesting is how later on you get that anyone who has packed is somehow mentally connected. I have been hit with the absolute sleepies this morning. Oh. Oh yeah, I forgot. One of the weapons is literally just hammer of god. <laughs> uh one's this the the only downside to the grinding to level up weapons is 
It all depends on the player's style of combat. Which one do you like? Do you like the heavy slow weapon? Do you like the fast weapon that doesn't do a lot of damage? In which case that is my personal style. Do, do you like a balance? I like the swords in this game personally the most because I like having speed over power. You can, you can have all the strength in the world, but it doesn't mean anything if you can't hit your target. The world's oath, they are the same. Oh yeah, and then you can just do that, and that counts towards the weapon. Did I switch back to Kaimus? Oh, I didn't good. I know a few of these weapons I managed to get to level 4 by the end of my playthrough. I, at this point in time of recording my voice, forget recording the game, recording my voice right now, um, I have yet to get all the weapons to level 4. There are a lot of them. And thankfully getting them to getting the weapons maxed out was not a requirement for unlocking anything. It's more just that you can grind them if you want to, and the bonus is that you get the maxed out stats on each weapon and the story. And it's 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 flavor text for more of Yoko Taro's world. Seal is above. The goddess seal is there. Nah, I wanted a charge spell, but these guys are making it difficult. Like I said, you see, the slow weapons, they're powerful, but they are very clunky. You gotta learn how to time those hits. Uh oh. I forgot some of that magic was really powerful. But also, note that when you switch weapons, you lose the magic you have charged that weapon. But there are spells that last, even if you switch weapons, I've learned. So a faster way to level up some of these weapons would be something like that, that Crimson Guardian spell, where you cast it, and then you can switch to another weapon, and then just run through enemies, and then that counts the... Even though it's the spell that's hurting the enemies, the deaths count to that weapon. Which is nice, it, it makes some of the grind a little easier. Oh, I guess I had to get up and do something. Um, cut this part? Never mind. No, I was oh no, I was checking to... <laughs> This as I narrate, this is actually something I might get into more often. I may go back through some of my previous playthroughs and re-upload them with commentary or something. I now that I have better audio equipment, I'm actually thinking of replaying some of my YouTube exclusive playthroughs from back when I first started. And I'm considering redoing some specific playthroughs from the first couple years, just because now I have better recording equipment and better a better understanding of how to like do some of these fun edits. See, that's a bad example of it. 
I mentioned like the good and bad of context earlier. That one I would file as a bad example because you walk into a room, you see three enemies that have target above their head, and then you have. It would be the the assumption would be, oh, I see. I have to eliminate the targets, and then someone in the game is like, we must we must slay them to move on. It's just like. I see the three big dudes with the targets on their head. Yeah, I think I know what I'm supposed to do by this point. Who knows, maybe at this point you're like me and you just mentally vegetabled out so hard that you're just like, yeah, nah, cool, thanks for the heads up. <laughs> Brain shut down. No thought, only violence. <laughs> This... It's funny that... If you pay attention to the story, this will tax on your brain. But if you were to... Why did I pause this? How long did I pause this? Okay, never mind. Um, this is the kind of game that would have been fun to play after a long workshop, like, you just had, like, a long day at work, you had to crunch all the numbers, you had to do customer service, you had to move some seriously heavy things. And then you could just... You're stressed, you're tired, you have a shower, take a cup of coffee, help you stay awake a little bit longer before going to bed. Then you just pop in a copy of Dragon Guard and brain off and de-stress. I have to think hard on the storyline because I'm the one making a video about it. So whoop de doodle me, but Lady Footy Ice Chamber. Otherwise this game is weirdly relaxing. Like the same way that Mortuary's assistant became weirdly relaxing once you've got the flow of how to perform your tasks down. I don't know, maybe I'm just weird. <laughs> yes, throw him at the girl you look. Lust as always. Hmm. But you helped me once again. It. This game doesn't have the best or worst voice acting I've ever heard, but I do like the subtle. Like he disapproves that Kaim is such a violent person, but also. He's like, yeah, you helped me. Time is the thank god you're on our side character. A pact. The castle is no longer safe. I, I thought I would take Furiai to the elf village. Since the elves are bound to eternal neutrality, the village will be a safe haven from the Empire. Mm -hmm. While it may be dangerous to take the goddess from the castle, what else is there to do? Furiai is the goddess that protects the sacred seal. But before that, she was my betrothed. I will protect her. Even that bit of exposition feels what about you, you natural just Furiai because Inuard is a character who feels... You know what requires attention? He, he demands attention for what he can do and for what he wants. Even if it's what no one else wants. 
I do good. Notice me, Kaim Senpai. Notice me, Forty Eye. I do good. I killed one thing. Kind of. I mean, Kaim helped. Perhaps we should celebrate. It, it shows his personality. Like even Kaim's like, really, dude. The usual song. But Forty Eye listen to it. They'll listen to it, you know, while soaked in blood. But. All things come to an end, and so I'll go ahead and wrap up my commentary for Chapter 1, and I'll see you all in Chapter 2. Till then, take care, and ta-ta for now.